Okay, yes. Yeah, so Fantastic. Anyway, uh, I'm happy to welcome Morgan Rogers to the to our uh, colloquium. Um, uh, are you, um, Morgan, are you, uh, what stage are you at? Why don't you tell us something about yourself? Are you doing your PhD right now or did you finish or? Right, I am soon to finish my PhD. I've got my defense coming up in a couple of weeks. Oh, I see, yeah. Yeah. And uh, how did you get into, uh, I don't want to do an interview here. But how did you end up in topos theory? Uh, well, I got interested in category theory quite early yeah. on in my um, undergrad. Uh -huh. um, and after I finished my master's, I, I was looking around for places that I could do a PhD in, in category theory. So now, uh, who do you work so with I, in Italy? Or? Yeah, Olivia Caramello. Oh, really? Who okay. specializes in, in topos theory. Right. Um, that, and she introduced me to the subject. So. Okay, uh, I'll let you uh, take it away. Great. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's nice to possibly be introducing some new people to topos theory. Um, so I'll get on with it. Uh, so let's start simple. And the topos of sets. So set theory, hopefully you've, you've seen so, around, around in your mathematical experience. Um, and if you have read any kind of introductory text in, in category theory, quite often the category of sets is given as an example because a category has objects, in this case sets, uh, and morphisms, in this case functions. And we can illustrate a lot of the basic notions of category theory in the category of sets. So for example, every object has uh, an identity morphism or, or function, which is just the function that does nothing. And if I have a function from one set to another, and then to yet another, then I can compose them. And this also kind of justifies the way that we denote composition. Um, so the, these basic building blocks form a category. And if you haven't seen any category theory before, then the rest of the talk might be a bit of a whirlwind, but um, it's nice to try and get people on board. So what else can we find? in this category of sets. And why do I say it's a topos? Well, there are some rather special objects and constructions that we can find among sets. Uh, we have the one element set, for example, which might seem quite humble in um, if you're used to just considering it as a set, but in the category of sets, it has the quite special property that there is exactly one function from any, of, any given set to the one element set. And similarly, the empty set has a special place in this category because the empty set admits exactly one function to every other set. Um, we can also perform some operations for combining sets. So you've hopefully encountered the Cartesian product where I take pairs consisting of an element of a, from a set A and an element from a set B. Um, and similarly, I, if I have a whole bunch of sets, maybe a set index collection of them, then I can take a product, which is just sequences indexed by the set I, where each element in the sequence is a, an element of this set AI. And another way that I can combine sets is to just take their disjoint union. So here's a formal way of doing this. I attach a, a label zero to each element of A, and I attach a label one to each element of B, and I just stick the results together. Um, and they're necessarily disjoint thanks to these extra labels. Um, and I can similarly form disjoint union of um, a larger collection of sets. Now, somehow these are universal constructions. Um, I'm not gonna make precise what that means, but if you've met limits and co-limits, these are instances of them. Um, and in particular, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example of this. This Cartesian product, A cross B, uh, has the universal property that whenever I have a pair of maps from some set C, uh, one map from C to A and another function from C to B, then there is a unique function from C to A cross B um, corresponding to that pair. So somehow this gives me pairs of 
morphisms into A and B. And similarly, the reason that um, on this side, the, the symbol for the co-product or disjoint union is just the, the upside down version of the one for product is because it has the dual property. Namely, if I have functions coming out of A and B or out of each member of my collection of sets, then I can find a unique function out of this co-product um, which combines them. So here's another example of a limit which we can perform in the category of sets and I'll, I'll need this later, which is why I mention it. Um, whenever I have a pair of maps like this, there is a universal way in the category of sets to complete this to a square, such that whenever I have a completion of this pair of maps to a square, then it factors through this one. And here's the, the formal definition of the, the pullback. Um, the notation I'm using, uh, perhaps this is more commonly seen, um, but the point is that this construction obviously depends on the morphisms f and g rather than just the objects a and b. So uh, a more exotic construction in the category of sets is the existence of this subobject classifier. So when I have a set, I can consider subsets of it, and any subset has a classifying map to the set with two elements. And what, that, what it means to be a classifying map is that when I look at this uh, one element subset of the two element set, and I take the pullback, which is the construction that we saw on the previous slide, then it reproduces the subset that I started with. And there's this unique correspondence between the maps from any object to um, the two element set and sub objects of subsets in this specific case of my original set. Okay, I'm not going to give you a formal definition of a Grotendieck topos, um, but a Grotendieck topos is our categories which share all of these features with sets and a few others. Um, and so, what I want to do in this talk basically is present some classes of examples of Grotendieck toposes, which have all of this structure, show you what the structure looks like, and then explain how um, understanding that these categories are instances of the same thing, namely Grotendieck toposes, mean, allows us to transfer um, both constructions and properties and ideas more generally between the two settings. Um, and this is, I, I guess, a motivated special case of the fact that this is possible for yet other ways of constructing growth and toposes. So the first example, monoid actions. So when I took algebra courses in um, my undergrad undergraduate math degree, um, we didn't meet monoids. So it's possible that you haven't either. Uh, so a monoid is a set which carries a special element and a binary operation, which is associative, uh, such that the element, the, the special element, the unit element, um, does nothing when I combine it with anything else. So that might sound familiar because groups are a special case of this, where we also have inverses for all the elements. Um, so if you're confused in this section by monoids, think about groups instead. So if I have a monoid, my favorite monoid M, then I can construct a category out of this by considering that monoid or group, if you prefer, acting on sets. Um, so just to remind you what that means, um, a right action of a, my monoid M is a set A, equipped with a, a function from A times M to A. So a way of taking elements in M and combining them with um, elements of A, uh, such that the identity element does nothing um, and such that it respects the multiplication. Perhaps this is a bit basic, but what's important about this is that it gives us an example of a topos. If I consider the category of all of these things, where the morphisms are homomorphisms, so just functions between the underlying sets that respect the action, then I get a category. And that is an example of a Grotendieck topos. 
and I'll, I'll show you later that it has all of the features um, that we saw previously. Now, I denote it like this because actually this is a special case of a pre-sheaf topos. So another way I can think of my monoid M is as a category with a single object. And I can think of an action as a functor from that one object ca category into the category of sets, or more precisely, from the dual of that one object category from M pop into the category of sets. Um, but I'm deliberately hiding all of that because I'm not assuming that you have met these things before. So here's another way of constructing examples of topos. Let X be a topological space. And I'll assume a separation property called sobriety on this space, which basically, but um, any, for example, Hausdorff space has this property. Uh, I can consider the category of spaces living over X, which is just to say other spaces Y equipped with a map to X. Um, and I can make a category out of these by considering maps between the over spaces that commute with the maps to X. So forming triangles like this. Um, and that's quite a nice category. Ultimately, that's the slice of the category of spaces um, over my favorite space X. Um, but what we actually want to consider is not all such spaces living over X, but more specifically, the local homeomorphisms. So I'm taking a subcategory of the one I just introduced. Um, and I'm asking that the maps to X should be local homeomorphisms, which is to say that for every point in the space above, there is an open neighborhood of it, uh, such that the restriction of the map down is a homeomorphism um, on that open set. So examples of this, uh, any open subspace of X, the inclusion of this is a local homeomorphism, because if I take any point in U, U is itself an open neighborhood, which um, is homeomorphic onto its image in X. Um, and another way is to take a bunch of copies of X and just stack them on top of each other and take the projection map. And that similarly gives me local homeomorphism. So I'm taking the subcategory of these things. And once again, we get an example of a written view topos. So let's see the structure that I mentioned earlier in this context. I feel like I'm talking quite quickly. So I'm going to slow down a little bit. <sighs> Just seen John's comment that he's glad that I use write actions. Um, and agreed. Uh, it, it, I find it also makes the expression of holomorphisms more intuitive um, because you can pull things out of the brackets on the right instead. So, uh, we started with the empty set uh, earlier. No, in fact, we started with the one element set. So let's look at that first. Um, so if I take the one element set, there is a unique action of any monoid on that set because um, I can think of the monoids as acting by endomorphisms of that one element set, and there's only one to choose. So every element of M effectively does nothing. And this gives me the trivial action and it so happens that for any monoid M, it's not really a coincidence, this is because it's true in the category of sets. Um, this is the terminal M action. So once again, it admits exactly one morphism from any other action of M on the set. Similarly, the total space of X, so if I just take the identity on X, um, it, it's the terminal local homeomorphism over X. Uh, and that amounts to saying, if I have any map into X, then it factors through the identity. Um, very simple argument, but still, it's nice to have it around. Uh, and on the flip side, the empty action and the empty space are the initial objects in these categories. So once again, just as in sets, there is exactly one map from this empty action or empty space to any other one. So here's the the picture for local homeomorphisms. So what about uh, products? So for M actions, I just take the product in the underlying sets, and then I let M act on each component. 
Uh, and it's actually a common theme in here. So whenever I want to build limits or co-limits of M actions, I do it by performing that operation on the underlying set and then just equipping the action component wise. Um, the, that forgetful functor creates all of the structure of the limits and co-limits, which I need to check that this is A. Um, for local homeomorphisms over X, things are a little bit more complicated, but in the finite case, that's, that's not so. So, um, for example, if I want to take a product of things living over X, I don't take their product as sets. Instead, I take their, the pullback of these spaces. Um, and one of the properties of local homeomorphisms is that they are stable under pullback. And what that means in, the, in this picture is that when I construct this, um, this pullback in, in the category of spaces, that when, whenever F is a local homeomorphism, then so is P primed. And flipping, flipping the diagram around, if F primed is a local homeomorphism, then so is P. And I can compose local homeomorphisms um, to get a local homeomorphism. So this F pull, pull back along F primed, um, the composing I, either way around this square gives me a, the same local homeomorphism as X. And that's the product in this category. A coproduct of M actions, as I mentioned, it's you just do the same thing on underlying sets. Um, and for spaces, actually, it's just as easy. So here are some examples, because I didn't give you pictorial examples of what coproducts look like earlier. Um, so for example, here, this is my bunch of copies of X, specifically five copies of X living over X, um, which I mentioned was an example of a local homeomorphism earlier. Another example here on the right is to take a bunch of open subsets of X, open subspaces of X, uh, and just to stack them on top of each other. Uh, and actually, I can reconstruct any local homeomorphism over X um, by constructing one of these stacks and then gluing some of the slices together along open subsets. And that'll be relevant very shortly. So I've skipped over pullbacks, which are quite similar to what we've already seen, uh, and go to the subobject classifier. So the subobject classifier in my category of M actions uh, is something quite special to, to um, my monoid. It's set of right ideals uh, with this action. So I, I have my collection of right ideals, uh, and I need to know, I, in order for it to be an object in this category, it needs to have an M action, and that M action looks like this. So whenever I have an ideal, and I am acting by M, then I get the ideal consisting of the subset of M, consisting of elements which, when I multiply them on the left by M, I get something in my original ID. Uh, this isn't necessarily super intuitive, um, where this comes from. And once again, I should mention that I'm kind of obfuscating some stuff, which I will discuss uh, shortly. So, what about the subobject classifier in this category of local homeomorphisms over X? So it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, in order to construct it, I need to take a bunch of copies of my space, and then I need to glue them together in a, a special way. So whenever I have a containment of opens, I, I have one copy of my base space for each open, sub, uh, open subspace. And whenever I have a containment, I glue the, the copies together along um, the smaller open. So here's an illustrative example, hopefully. Uh, so I have my space X. It only has two non-trivial open subsets, U and V, plus the empty. So I have four copies. Um, now the empty is contained in everything, but when you glue along the empty set, nothing happens. Um, v is contained in U, so I'm gluing this copy of, um, of X along V to both this one and this one, 
And then similarly, U is contained in X, so I glue this to, um, to, to the bottom. Um, OK, fine. I've shown you that they have the properties before that I showed you in the category of sets. As I mentioned, there are some other properties that they also inherit, um, which you're just going to have to trust me on and or check for yourself. <laughs> uh, but really, I, I can present these in a different way to demonstrate that they are instances of the same thing. So here, even the notation I'm using is saying, this is an example of a pre-sheaf topos, uh, a, a pre-sheaf category. If you know what a pre-sheaf is, it's uh, a functor from the dual of a category into the category of sets. Um, but really the point is that I have a generic way of defining broken deep toposes, namely as left exact localizations of pre-sheaf categories. Um, and this is immediately an example because it's already a pre-sheaf category. And you can show that this category of local homeomorphisms is, can instead be expressed as a subcategory of a category of pre-sheaves where the underlying category is the, the partially ordered set of opens of X viewed as a category. Um, and really everything I've shown you is, is just instances of this. But the reason I've obfuscated that and the reason that I'm showing you all of, all of these features in the different contexts and in the respective languages of monoid actions and local homeomorphisms is that really these are perspectives, ways of understanding toposes, but conversely, these toposes, these, these the categories that I've constructed are fundamentally related to the monoid M and the space X in ways that are relevant to the theory of monoids, so semi-group theory, and topology, respectively. That is, these constructions, it's not just a coincidence that we can do this. Actually, these are categories with common properties which encode important features of the respective ways of building. So here's a slide where I say more or less what I've just said. Um, so we've seen analogies between these two cases because they're both instances of growth. Um, and already the language of category theory is very useful for understanding that kind of analogy. When I see constructions in different contexts, which somehow look similar, um, typically the way that we formalize that kind of analogy is to say these constructions live in a certain category and the universal properties of these constructions, what they look like relative to the other objects of those categories is a common description of the, these constructions. And that's a way that category theory in general can be used for expressing analogies. But I want to go a little bit deeper here for something that's specific to topos theory. Um, so first I need to explain to you how these are very different flavors of topos. Um, but the important follow-up um, aspect of this is that beyond these constructions on objects, these respective toposes inherit properties that are determined by the properties of the monoid and the space respectively. Um, and so even though they're different flavors of topos, I can translate these properties in the language of topos theory between these two situations. Um, and I can use that to understand what different concepts should correspond to or what my analogies should be. And I can also make formal um, proofs in the respective context involving the respective properties. Um, and hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll give a, a sketch of what I mean by that later on. So, how do these types of topos differ? How do these constructions differ? Every object of this category of local homeomorphisms, I briefly mentioned earlier, can be constructed by gluing together open subspaces of X along other opens. So I take a bunch of open subspaces 
and I stack them up over X and I glue some of them together. And because I'm only gluing together um, open subspaces, it's still true that around every point of that, of the result, um, I can restrict my downward mapping function to, um, to be a homeomorphism. So what do these open subspaces correspond to in this topos? I mentioned them as a special case, and it turns out that these are the subterminal objects. So I mentioned that the identity over X is the terminal object in this category. And the point is that the open subspaces exist as objects in the category, which inject into my terminal object the identity on X. And when I say inject into, Formally, what I mean is there's a monomorphism in this category um, from any subspace viewed as a space over X into that terminal object. And what the previous line is saying then is that I can reconstruct any object of the topos in terms of a decomposition in terms of subterminal objects. And so these objects generate this topos. Um, this is in a formal sense, but not quite an algebraic sense. If you're used to say uh, a group being generated by a certain number of elements, um, it's, it's actually a, a very analogous process, except that here we're allowed to glue together arbitrarily infinitely many collections of things. Still set in things though, I should mention. So toposes with this property that they're generated by the subterminals are called localic toposes. Uh, and actually, we've seen somehow most locality toposes constructed in this way. To get all of them over sets, uh, we need to expand the notion of space that we're using a little bit to, to locales. Um, and what that, what that basically consists of is saying, actually, this construction only depends on the open subset structure of X because of the assumption I mentioned earlier about the separation property. Um, and somehow, we can include spaces, so these locales, which are defined purely in terms of uh, a collection of opens, which shares the same property as a collection of opens in a, in a topological space. So a frame um, is what it's specifically called. Um, and viewing these as spaces, they might not necessarily have enough points, but they're defined in terms of their, their open subsets and our top kind of topological in flavor. And so all of the topological constructions, which only involve opens, lift to this, this notion of locality. But anyway, you can just keep thinking of X as, as a nice topological space. Now in my topos of um, M actions, if I look at the terminal object, that, remember that that was the one element set with a trivial M action. So if I look at sub actions of that, there's not very much that I can do because a sub action is a subset with the restriction of the action on the, the larger thing. And the only subsets of the one element set are the empty action and the thing I started with. So in particular, if I consider any non-trivial monoid, then that monoid acts on itself by multiplication on the right. And there's no way that I can construct that action by gluing together copies of the empty action or the trivial action, because in the trivial action, all of the monoid elements act by the identity, um, whereas that's not true in, in, for my monoid acting on itself, for example. So what I'm saying then is that this can never be localic unless M is a, a trivial monoid. And another way of seeing that is that every object in, in here is either empty or its unique homomorphism to the terminal action, to that trivial action, is surjective because any action of M on the set, on a non-empty set, is going to be acting on a set with a, at least one element. And so I get a surjection to um, my trivial action. So it turns out that this corresponds to um, the property of being hyperconnected, um, this, this observation above. 
which is equivalent to some other conditions. Uh, I'll, I'll mention some of those later. There's, there's a reason for this name. Um, but unlike in the previous slide, there are many, many more examples of hyperconnected classes. So this is not representative of that class. But it's a property that is incompatible with uh, the localic property that we saw on the previous slide, which means that there is these two classes of toposes have trivial intersection. If I have a topos that is expressible, so if I have topos in this form and a topos in this form, um, which are equivalent to one another, that means that the monoid has to be trivial and the space has to be trivial. There's no other way for that to happen. Um, which is what I'm saying here. So somehow the consequence of this is that there's no direct translation possible. I can't say, here's a monoid, I build my topos of actions out of it, and actually I can view this as a topos of local homeomorphisms over some space X, and there's some way of translating properties of M into properties of X. That can never happen in that precise way because there's no such M and X exist. So how, how exactly can I make analogies precise between these two disjoint worlds in that case? Um, and how I'm gonna do this, this is moving into uh, a joint paper that I wrote with Jens where the emphasis was on understanding these um, toposes and monoid actions better but where we did that by taking properties from spaces um, and, and seeing what happened when we tried to apply them to, to these toposes. Uh, but I, I, I'm gonna take a, a, a slightly shifted perspective here where I'm comparing them on equal footing. So what I'm illustrating in this slide is that any topos, any Grotten Beek topos, um, has a particular relationship with the topos of sets. Namely, I have these adjoint functors um, to the topos of sets. Uh, this gamma is called the global sections functor, and it's constructed by considering the global sections in this, uh, as the name would suggest. Uh, and if you don't know what that means, remember that I had my terminal object in my category of local homeomorphisms was the identity on X. And so if I have some other space living Y living over X, I can consider the collection of maps from X to Y, which form the, the necessary triangles. And so these are, these are sections of the map from Y to X. And there's a set of them, of course, because there's only a set of maps between any two spaces. Um, and it turns out that this is functorial. Um, and moreover, it is adjoint to this delta, which is the, the constant map, uh, which sends any set A to the disjoint union of indexed by A of copies of X. So I just take a big pancake stack, as we saw earlier, but where the number of pancakes is indexed by the set that I'm considering in the bottom. And these functors that I end up with are, are adjoint to, to one. But actually, that technique works for, for any Grotten Beek topos. So it so happened that my terminal object was the identity on X in, in this case, but I can just consider maps from the terminal object to any other object. Um, and for the actions of a monoid, what this does is it sends any M action to the set of fixed points for that action, uh, which obviously is a similarly interesting operation to perform. Um, and we still have this adjoint delta, which sends any set to the trivial action of M on that set. Uh, but in this, in, for, for any monoid, we actually have a further adjoint to that, which sends any M action to the collection of connected components for the action with, sorry, connected components with respect to the action. So that is, I take my M action, I take the underlying set, and I have an equivalence relation on that set that's generated by X being related to X dot M. So 
x acted on by m. And I, I generate an equivalence relation, and I take the quotient by that, and that gives me the connected components. Um, to understand why I'm calling them connected components, it helps to think of my m action, each m giving me an arrow from its, the element it's acting on to the image of that element of the action. And then it's literally the connected component of that direct. So the existence of this adjoint, of this extra adjoint C, as I'm calling it, um, means that these, the, this topos of actions of M is always a locally connected topos. And we'll see the reason for that name very shortly. Uh, we also have that this delta is full and faithful, basically because any function between trivial actions um, is a valid homomorphism for the, for the trivial action. Um, and what that translates to is saying that this geometric morphism um, from my topos of actions to the topos of sets is connected. Now, these names of properties are quite geometric in nature, and there's a good reason for that. Um, here's yet another example of a property that's geometric in nature. Uh, that the global sections morphism is compact. And what that formally means is that this right adjoint gamma, so remember that that sends any m set to its set of fixed points, um, it preserves filtered unions of subobjects of any m action. Um, essentially, because if I have a fixed point of a union, then it, it must be a, a fixed point of some some element in that union, some subset in that union. OK. So actually, if I transfer each of these properties, locally connected, connected, compact, um, to the other side, to the other class of toposes, then this topos of local homeomorphisms over x has these respective properties if and only if x is x has those properties as a space. So X is connected, locally connected, or compact, respectively. Um, and you'll find that a lot of names of properties of things in topos theory come from the case of spaces, because in some sense, um, in fact, in, in a very precise sense, uh, the entire motivation for the theory of broken deep toposes comes from this special case of local homeomorphisms over a fixed space X. Um, or more precisely, the equivalent formulation of sheaves over X. I feel like I hinted at that earlier, but didn't explicitly say it, uh, that this category of local homeomorphisms over X is equivalent to the category of sheaves of sets over the space X. And if you've, if you've done any algebraic geometry, you'll have met sheaves um, and we'll see the connection. So why, why does that matter that I can identify these properties? Well, what, what it literally means is that whenever I have an argument that involves these properties of being connected, locally connected, or compact, um, a topological argument, I can literally lift that argument to the topos level, and it becomes an argument that purely references things happening at, at, the, at the topos level, which means that that proof, or even just the, the concepts in that proof, have meaning in the alternative class of, of examples that I'm giving you. Um, now, I'm not going to give you a, a really compelling example of that, um, much as I would like to, just because that is work that hasn't been done. Um, and you'll see why it hasn't been done from the examples that I'm going to show you in, in the rest of the presentation. Um, ultimately, these are quite basic properties and more complex properties of, of spaces are automatically complicated enough that um, few to no people have spent a lot of time or devoted a lot of time to lifting them to the topos level and seeing what happens. Um, which 
in the early stages of this kind of translation is, is all you can really hope for. Um, that is to say, while there's a lot of potential here, the reason that it's unrealized is because it's a lot of work which won't necessarily yield anything new or unexpected, um, or, or you can't tell whether it's going to yield anything new or unexpected in, in advance. It's a very mechanical process. It's, if anything, straight, relatively straightforward exercises in, in category theory, topology, et cetera. Um, and it has the potential to produce constructions in algebra from topology, um, which are new and surprising, but there's no guarantee that that's going to be the case in advance. So I'll say maybe a, a, a little bit more about that right at the end, um, if I have any time left. So let's have a look. Uh, the main types of example that I'm going to give of further properties that can be transferred um, from spaces to monoids uh, come from looking at special kinds of points. So first, here's a type of point that I can find in a space. Uh, a focal point uh, is a point X in my favorite space X, such that the only open set containing, X, containing little X is the whole space. So here's the picture. Um, I have my space from earlier, and I have a point here, little x, that is outside of every non-trivial open. Um, and the result that we need, the relevant result, to translate this into the language of topos theory is to the observation that x has such a point, um, and because of the separation assumption that I mentioned earlier, such a point is automatically unique. If and only if the topos of local homeomorphisms over X is a local topos, which means that this global sections functor has an extra right adjoint. And what that right adjoint does is it sends any set to um, the, the, a, a very thin stack living just over this uh, focal point. Yeah, I think that's the right way around. So now that we have expressed this property as a topos property, we can say, okay, what does that look like for a monoid? So a monoid of right, a topos of right actions of a monoid is a local topos, if and only if M has a right absorbing element. Um, and what do I mean by right absorbing element? It's some element X, such that whenever I multiply it by something on the right, I just get X back again. And there's a certain, I'm, I'm not gonna get, try and present the proof to you. It's relatively straightforward. You, you plug in all of, all of the data that you have at your disposal. Uh, the nice thing really is that there are some other equivalent conditions um, to, to this being, being local for, for monoids. Um, but there's a sense in which these properties somehow feel similar. Here I have a, a point of my space that lives outside of everything else. And here I have a, an element of my monoid that interacts in a certain way with all of the other elements of the monoid. Um, and the, the takeaway here is that these are very concretely analogous properties of from spaces to monoids. So kind of dually, a dense point is a point such that the only closed set containing X, containing my point is the whole space. So that in particular means that my point is contained in all of the non-empty opens. So here's, here's the picture. Um, I have X contained in all of, all of the non-empty opens. Um, and this turns out to be equivalent to, to asking that my space is totally connected. Um, and <laughs> the, the reason for that is quite straightforward, um, which is that this, the, the reason for the name that is, um, which is that this point X automatically forces the space to be connected and it literally lives in every single open. So this space is very non, very indecomposable. 
Um, and concretely, what that means at the top top loss level is that this functor C, so as I mentioned here, X has to be locally connected. And I mentioned earlier that that corresponds to the existence of this adjoint C um, in, the, in the space situation. Um, and being totally connected corresponds to this adjoint preserving finite limits. So it's just an extra condition on one of the functors involved. And that makes it relatively easy again to translate to, uh, to monoids. My topos of monoid actions is totally connected if and only if M has this property of being right collapsible, which is not quite dual to the property that we saw on the previous slide. We'll see the dual of that property shortly. Um, but what it says is that whenever I have a pair of elements, there is some element M dependent on this pair, um, which when I multiply on the right rather than the left, um, results in an equal result. So this obviously makes you curious about what the, the property corresponding to the, the dual of having a right absorbing element, that is, what does it mean when my monoid has a left absorbing element? And that's quite similar. So if I have a locally connected topological space as before, uh, and it has a dense point, which is also open, so the singleton of, of that point on its own, uh, is an open subset. Um, that happens if and only if the, my topos of local homeomorphisms over X is a co-local topos. Um, this is a, a name that Jens and I made up, um, essentially because it produces the dual situation in, in, in the monoid case. Um, and what it literally means is that this adjoint C has a further left adjoint. So you can see if you... Um, remember your adjoint functor calculus that this in particular implies that C um, preserves all small limits rather than just uh, finite ones. Um, and indeed, as, as you might have hoped, um, for monoids, this corresponds to M having a left absorbing element. So some element X such that Y X equals X or Y in my monoid. So one last example. Um, I'm going to say, well, a special case of monoids is a group. A special case of a monoid is a group. So can I tell by looking at the top of actions that my monoid is a group? Um, and indeed, we can. So a monoid is a group if and only if uh, its top of actions is an atomic top -loss. Uh, which means that delta preserves uh, the subobject classifier, which we, we have seen, and exponential objects, which we have not seen. Um, but exponential objects in the topos of sets are quite easy. Uh, the exponential x to the power of y is just the set of functions from y to x. And we have a similar structure, that is, a structure with the same universal property in any broken deep topos. And this is saying that delta sends my function sets to the corresponding object in um, my category of actions. Um, but another way of expressing this, it turns out, uh, is that this topos is Boolean, which means that every sub M action is complemented. And that's a little bit easier to understand, because if I have a group action, then um, any sub action has to be a, a union of orbits, right? Um, and so if I have some union of orbits, then I can always take all of the rest of the orbits to get a complement. Whereas if you imagine, for example, an action of the natural numbers, um, the natural numbers acting on itself by addition, say, uh, then I can take a subaction, which is all of the numbers greater than or equal to two, um, which is closed under addition. Uh, but the, the complement of that zero and one clearly is not cl closed under um, the action, the operation of addition. Um, so that's an example of, uh, that, that shows that the top loss of actions of the natural numbers is not Boolean. And indeed the natural numbers with addition are, do not form a group. So comparing 
that property to uh, in, in the space case, we find that the topos of local homeomorphisms over X is a Boolean topos if and only if X is a discrete space. Um, and we can kind of see that this has to be the case even just by looking at the um, subterminal objects. So remember that the subterminal objects in, in this topos correspond to the open subspaces of X. And so already asking that those are complemented um, forces, so being complemented to saying, I have some other subobject where the intersection is empty and the union is the whole space. So already every open subspace has to be also closed. Um, but if we if we demand that of the of every object in this category, then it forces X to be a discrete space. So I, I wanted to ramp up with the um, the basics of, of category theory of, of topos theory in, in this presentation, which means that in the second half of the talk, I've only really presented the the simpler properties from that paper with the answer that I mentioned. Um, and I'll put up the reference at the end if, you, if you're interested in it. Uh, there are a lot more properties that you might want to explore, and there are some obstacles to that, namely that not everything can be expressed directly in terms of the uh, global sections geometric morphism. Um, so you have to build up some further topos theory in order to express properties at the topos level in the first place, and then to, similarly to translate back down. So here's, here's the example that I'm giving um, that being Hausdorff as a space, you can express that as the diagonal map for the space uh, being, being closed. Um, that's basic point set topology. And we can, th this, this map, this diagonal map induces a geometric morphism, which I can construct purely in terms of the global sections morphism. Um, it requires a little bit more work. And, I can also express the notion of being closed at the top of level. So I, I can completely translate this property up. The challenge then is translating back down again. So identifying when the diagonal of the, the global sections morphism for the, the top of actions is closed. Um, but it's, it's something that Jens and I are, are working on. And it's generally quite satisfying. Um, I'm not really expecting us to make hu huge waves with this kind of translation effort um, in, in the very near future. Um, but really what, I, what I'm hoping to do is what I put in the title of the talk, uh, is to make analogies precise so that when we have inspiration from topology that we want to apply in algebra or vice versa, um, that we have a, a framework and mechanisms for doing just that. So these analogies are concrete. I, I kind of discussed that earlier, um, that we can, we can lift proofs and constructions. Um, but another thing I want to emphasize is that this is just a special case, right? I've only presented to you two classes of growth and leak toposes, and there are a bunch of other ways of building them. And each way of building growth and toposes gives us this kind of translation from the world that those constructions originate in into topos theory and then back down through any of the other constructions. Um, so here are some other ways. Uh, we can build them from sites. That's the most general one. Uh, but there are also special classes of sites with, with certain properties, uh, which, we, which we could examine individually. Um, I've only mentioned discrete monoids, but we can use topological monoids too. Uh, you can build um, toposes out of inverse semigroups, um, which is not a special case of what I've presented here. Um, so I put, put down the bottom here, um, Jonathan's constructions of toposes from inverse semigroups are not just turn it into a monoid and then put pre-sheaves on it. It's a, it's a more interesting construction. Um, and there are more um, abstract ones like localic groupoids and geometric theories, which have their, their own um, geometric algebra and 
logic connotations and, and theories behind them. Um, and finally, for me personally, um, I spent my whole thesis trying to understand monoids better or trying to work out what we could understand about monoids from looking at their toposes. Um, and having a way of transforming geometric ideas into ideas about monoids um, was a very structured way for me to do that. So um, maybe this will in inspire someone um, to similarly seek to, to extend up, up their understanding from one area of, of maths to another through this theory. Thank you very much. And uh, here's the references. Um, we have McLean and Mordike is, is a good um, basic reference for uh, understanding topos theory. So a lot of the stuff that I gave you in the first half can be um, found in, in, in there. And here's the, the paper I mentioned with Jens, um, monoid properties as topos theoretical Oh, I'll leave that up. Well, thank you very much, Morgan. Shall we uh, thank the speaker? You can. So, uh, well, we have a bit of, uh, we have a minute or two, perhaps. Uh, um, I'll ask for questions. Anyone have uh, questions? About anything or comments? I have a, anyone? I have a question. Um, just, yes, go ahead. Um, hi, Morgan. Thank you for the really interesting talk. Those results are, are pretty neat. Um, so I, I'm not sure um, the answer might be uh, no, but um, uh, the, um, the the sequences of adjoints you're using to characterize some of these properties. Um, mm -hmm. It reminds me a bit of some of the stuff we see uh, go on uh, with cohesive toposes. So are there any connections or analogies that you could speak to there? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's a, actually Jens and I used toposes built from monoid actions to provide a, a counter example to um, a, a conjecture that some conjunction of, of properties um, automatically produces a cohesive geometric morphism. Um, but we, we found more generally that actually monoids are small and manageable enough that you can you can produce examples of um, cohesive toposes using them. Um, yeah, yeah I have slight, something more insightful to say. So you, you're, you're welcome to give any comments that you have about that yet versus of monoid actions in that direction. Uh, so I think the example that we have, for example, is uh, if you take um, a commutative monoid and then it has a, if it has a zero element, then it should be the category of pre sheaves on it should be a cohesive topos, for example. Right. Um, yeah, um, and uh, we can also construct uh, pre-cohesive geometric morphisms from one uh, one topos of pre-sheaves on a monoid to another topos of pre-sheaves on a monoid. So that's another option. What's nice about that is that we can express that kind of geometric morphism in terms of monoid homomorphisms. So we have a, a concrete algebraic way of of dealing with these things. Thanks, Jens. Did you say you answered the Hausdorff question or not? Or um, <laughs> I didn't. No, no. There's there's a a document. So so that's one of several properties that can be expressed in terms of properties of the the diagonal morphism. Um, and you know, Jens and I have a, a the beginnings of a collaborative paper on that where we've we've m made a little bit of progress, but I can't. Uh -huh. I can't tell you what the answer is, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay. We haven't looked really a lot at the Hausdorff case, I think. Mm. Yeah, because we were focusing on openness because mm. there is a, a particular um, construction uh, by Conan Consigny called, called the root of 
uh, a monoid, which is it just amounts to taking the slice over the monoid acting on itself. Um, but you can get a lot of uh, a lot of mileage out of considering that um, for considering open var variants variations of, of open morphisms. Um, so we haven't gotten around to closed morphisms um, and properties yet. Well, very nice. Anyone further questions? Um, well, all right. Uh, thank you very much, Morgan. A very interesting talk. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks um, for inviting me again. I guess uh, that is, it's past one thirty now, I guess. Anyway, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you. Goodbye. Uh, perhaps we'll see you again at the, uh, the category theory uh, meeting this evening. Yes. Anyway, goodbye. <laughs> if the time zones line up. <laughs> yeah. bye. It's a little late. <laughs>